Hello and welcome to the Australian National University. I'm Dr. Rhys Crawley, a historian in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre uh, within the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs here at the ANU. SDSC has a long and rich history of researching and writing about intelligence agencies both within Australia and the region and we're currently undertaking the official history of ASIO, the first volume of which came out last year. Today I'm joined by Professor Keith Jeffrey from Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, Professor Jeffrey is the author or editor of 14 books on British military, uh, imperial, and of course, as the official historian of uh, the Secret Intelligence Service, or MI6, intelligence history as well. During his visit to Australia, Professor Jeffrey addressed a large audience at the ANU, where he discussed some of the challenges facing intelligence organisations in the past, and some of the changes and continuities that they face today in the age of terror. For those interested, you can find that lecture on the ANU podcast website. But today, Professor Jeffrey has made time to answer some questions along those lines. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor. It's a pleasure. One of the key themes that you discussed in your lecture was the significance that security and intelligence agencies place on secrecy, mm -hmm. and particularly concerning their sources and methods. Mm -hmm. What, why is this important? How do they go about it? And what are some of the consequences if they get that wrong? Well, the absolute core requirement for any intelligence organization is to protect its sources. Because once you reveal or you, once you give your target some suggestion of, of how you're getting information against them, they can take uh, um, steps to protect this. Now, the obvious uh, example of this, for example, is in signals intelligence. Mm -hmm. And during the war, uh, one of the greatest secrets of the war and the greatest intelligence triumph of the war was the ultra secret. Bletchley Park, about which we know a lot, mm -hmm. there are movies and novels and all sorts of stuff about this, um, but where they cracked the German codes. Now, if the Germans had found that their codes had been cracked, they would have changed the system mm -hmm. uh, and denied the British access to, uh, for example, naval enigma, uh, in which it made a crucial difference in the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, German submarines reporting in uh, um, their position um, uh, in the Atlantic uh, it was immediately available to the British, or more or less. I mean, it wasn't as, as easy as that, of course, but once the, the process had been developed, um, then you could target these submarines and you could neutralize or largely neutralize the threat. Um, but it was absolutely essential to keep this secret, not just, of course, from the Germans, but generally so, because careless talk, as the old wartime poster goes, uh, um, uh, you know, careless talk can lose lives. Um, and in some ways, the way it was processed was as important as the information itself. Mm. Yeah, loose lips sink ships. Yes, that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Another related aspect that you touched on was the dichotomy between keeping states or keeping state secrets from one's own public mm -hmm. when your adversary yeah. surely knows about yeah. those secrets yeah. already. Are you able to share some examples from history of, of that occurring? Well, there was a crazy period for 80 years when the British government denied the existence of its security and intelligence organizations. MI5 and MI6 were both established uh, as the same organization in 1909. And until the 1980s, uh, and for MI6 the 1990s, there was no statutory recognition of these organizations. Now, in a way, the dogs in the street knew that they existed. Dogs had megaphones in the street. Um, um, everyone knew there were spies and organizations of this sort. But no British government representative could be got to uh, confirm this. They would say, I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of this. Now, that led to a kind of absurd position where, for example, the headquarters of MI6, which was first in a place called Broadway um, in the interwar and wartime period. Then it moved to um, a century house, which is, is south of the river uh, near the Imperial War Museum. Um, uh, and it was against the law to identify these buildings. Century House was 13, 14 stories high. It's quite big. You can see this sort of thing. Now, the Russians knew about Century House, but the British people who paid for it and who were being protected by it were prohibited from sharing that information. And this kind of absurdity um, eventually it proved impossible to sustain. Now, of course, as we can see from the James Bond movies, now, if you watch Skyfall, there are only two, I think, facts relating to intelligence and Skyfall. One is that the headquarters of the organization is that Roxy building, again, south of the river at Vauxhall Cross uh, in, in London. Second 
fact is that it has been attacked by, it was attacked by IRA mortar bomb um, uh, during the uh, Northern Ireland Troubles. So it's vulnerable uh, and it exists. Beyond that, of course, the James Bond stuff is entirely fiction. But mm. it, 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 there was this absurd period in which they knew more about the intelligence than we were allowed to know. Mm. Yeah, funny situation, mm. uh, which we see all, all over the world. In the post 9-11 world, where the intelligence community, particularly that in the US, was criticised for siloing its information, we've witnessed an expansion of the need to share. Mm. And the result, and we see this through WikiLeaks and mm. through uh, the Snowden revelations, has been a joined up mm. worldwide intelligence network. What are your impressions on the desirability of mm. the need to share compared to the need to know and that compartmentalization yeah. that yeah. you see in the first 40 years of, of yes. MI6? Yeah. Well, need to know is, of course, one of the great bases of security and confidentiality. I mean, it works in private life as well. You doctor and your medical advisors need to know about your condition, mm -hmm. but I don't think necessarily your colleagues or you know your wider family, if you don't want to share it, do. So compartmentalization is part of human life and in part of the normal privacy and confidentiality. Now, on a state level, there are different issues here in that uh, the technology and the ability to share information is one way of making it useful. Um, and being able to put together previously unrelated facts uh, that might then target uh, um, uh, you know, enemies of the state or people who wish us ill. Um, you need to do that. You need to join up the information that the police have in, with, let's say, the security service in Britain MI5, uh, with, uh, um, let's say, airline records, travel records, mobile phone records, all this sort of stuff. Now, that brings with it a danger of a hugely intrusive state apparatus spying on its citizens and it kind of subverts the uh, working assumption that we are innocent unless proven guilty um, and one of the problems about the security state is that it assumes as with security in an airport the whole point of security in an airport if you think about it is that everyone is suspect um, and we're all kind of guilty until we pass through the uh, x-ray machines mm. and we're then declared innocent now that's that's quite troubling in a way it's not necessarily reassuring. Mm. Um, uh, so you have to balance these uh, um, needs for joined up and connected uh, information gathering with legitimate concerns for private confidenti confidentiality and, and privacy. Mm. Yeah. I think building on from that, and, and we've seen this with the leaks, do you think that those leaks will tighten that intelligence belt? Or is, as Michael Hayden has said, that the benefits of sharing, do they outweigh the risks of another Snowden? Mm. Well, intelligence organizations internationally have shared information and must share information and will continue to do that. I think it's salutary, one of the salutary things, particularly of Edward Snowden's revelations, which revealed high levels of cooperation between uh, countries within what might loosely call the Western Alliance, but not just those, of course. Uh, what Snowden has revealed is that this exists and kind of authoritatively done so. Now, I think that's a fact of life. It's not going to stop. Um, but I do think in a democracy you do need a countervailing um, accountability regime that says that requires permission to do these things which may be transcend civil liberties. Um, there's always going to be a tension between the maintenance of the correct maintenance of civil liberties and the need for security. Um, and on a kind of uh, spectrum mm. of, uh, you know, at one end you have the police state, which we don't want, but at the other end you have anything goes, which we don't want either. With your unique insight into the intelligence agencies, both you know, having access to their records and also outside, sitting as a scholar outside of, of, of their control, do you think? we, the West, or p perhaps the UK in particular, have got that balance between civil li liberties, human rights and security right? Well, it of course is a matter of trust um, in this sense, and we could trust our public servants 
to do the right thing all the time, but we also need regulations and rules just to keep them, uh, concentrate their minds as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And there will be points at which the intelligence agencies want to um, interfere and, and, as it were, intrude into our private lives. That's fine, but they need to be able to justify the need for this. And that's going to produce a bit more of a bureaucracy. It's going to make it potentially more difficult, but nobody said democracy was the most efficient form of government. Um, it is inefficient, but it's a lot better than some of the alternatives. And it's an important debate to keep having, and we're having it here in Australia at the moment, um, particularly, I think, following from the Snowden revelations and, and looking at collection of metadata and things like that. Yeah. But, um, I think you know, that you've provided us a really mm. neat insight into the mystique of mm. the intelligence mm. world from someone who's been, had one foot in and one foot out for the last mm. five or six mm. years. Um, and I, I think, you know, apart from the dry martinis and the fast mm. cars, mm. Uh, there's certainly a different picture there. Mm. So I'd like to thank you again for coming to see us. And I would, I would uh, stress to anyone or urge anyone who's interested in the real story of MI6, mm. not the James Bond story, to pick up a copy of one of the many uh, prints or editions of, of this MI6 book mm. here um, uh, by Professor Keith Jeffrey. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you.